speaker. Uh, this is Dr. John Harris. Thank you. Uh, I need to get permission to share screen. I think somebody's yeah. sharing right now. Yeah, I can't. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all uh, today from all over the world. I understand over a thousand, um, well over a thousand participants. And I am sitting in the middle of a uh, nor'easter snowstorm. Um, so there are huge snowflakes falling pretty fast. Uh, it's accumulating quickly in my backyard. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to be with you all uh, in India, in hot places, and uh, in, in me in the middle of snow. Um, I've been tasked to uh, talk about advances in immune mechanisms of vitiligo. Uh, a lot has happened over the last 10, and 10 to 15 years, and it's really an exciting time. Um, it's not a lot of time to, to, to present it all, but I'm going to do my best. So I think everything really begins with genetics. Um, you heard Dr. Spritz earlier today, and uh, he has identified, uh, he and others have identified many genes associated with vitiligo, and, and importantly, most of them actually fall squarely within the immune system. Um, and so this really indicates that the immune system plays an important role in driving vitiligo. Uh, and, and so there, there's actually some background there. If, if everybody can mute, that will help. Um, really indicating that vitiligo is, is definitely an immune-mediated disease. However, there are a number of genes that fall within melanocytes as well, indicating that uh, this is probably a crosstalk between melanocytes and the immune system that drives autoimmune. Melanocytes and the immune system that drives. So uh, additional data really starting in the 90s indicated that T cells infiltrated lesions in uh, very closely to melanocytes that were dying and that these T cells were in particular CD8 T cells. So this really indicated or suggested that CD8 T cells might be driving this, this uh, pathogenesis. I really like this paper in 2009 by Jasper Vandenborn and Rosalie Luton. Uh, where they took lesional skin and cultured T cells out of it and reintroduced those T cells to non-lesional skin from the same patient. And those T cells crawled into the skin and killed the melanocytes. So that, that's a really good indication that T cells drive this uh, disease. In particular, CD8 T cells were the subpopulation that was required. And, and they're both necessary and sufficient for vitiligo. Uh, a number of groups identified interferon gamma uh, as being upregulated in lesional skin. We looked at both human skin and mouse skin together, and we found a loss of melanocyte transcripts, which you'd expect with, mel with uh, melanocyte loss and vitiligo. And then we saw that interferon gamma was a prominent gene that drove other genes downstream uh, as, and represented an interferon gamma signature uh, in vitiligo lesional skin. Um, and this is important because we have great biologics that target type 17 inflammation and type 2 inflammation. And, and the reason they don't work for vitiligo is because those pathways are not expressed in vitiligo patients. And we really, until recently, didn't have anything that targeted uh, type 1 inflammation or interferon gamma. So interferon gamma signaling is, is pretty simple. It signals through its receptor, JAX1 and 2, STAT1. Uh, chemokine CXCL9 and 10 that signal the receptor CXCR3 on T cells to recruit them to the skin. And, and a lot of groups have, have focused on interferon gamma uh, as uh, the mechanism of pathogenesis. We have knocked out many members of this pathway uh, in our mouse model and found that that prevents vitiligo. We also found that targeting a number of these with antibodies both prevents and reverses vitiligo. And we found that JAK inhibitors worked in our mouse model as well. Uh, but maybe more importantly, JAK inhibitors work in humans. So this is a case uh, that we shared with Angela Cristiano and her group in New York, where the patient took oral ruxolitinib and repigmented really significantly on his face over uh, about four or five months. We had incidentally saved up his blood for over a year uh, and found that uh, when we started, he, he had very high levels of CXCL10 in his blood and they were stable. Um, until we started ruxolitinib, and then those levels dropped significantly, really suggesting that not only were JAK inhibitors effective in vitiligo, but they appeared to be blocking interferon gamma and downstream um, um, chemokines. In addition, others uh, published studies as well. Um, Brett King and David Rosmarin showed that JAK inhibitors were effective in vitiligo. And, and this really provided the rationale for clinical trials to test JAK inhibitors in vitiligo. And a, a number of people, uh, Dr. Pandia, Dr. Grimes, will be presenting data um, from, an ins from the INSIGHT clinical trial that was recently published, the phase two trial, um, with, with really uh, impressive results. Um, 
questions have come up about type 1 interferon. Uh, we did not see uh, indication of type 1 interferon expression, but it's, it shares a lot of pathways with type 2 or interferon gamma. And, and so um, Julian Seneschal and, and, and his colleagues published a paper looking at CXCL9 expression, its receptor CXCR3, MXA uh, expression, and all these can be induced by type 1 interferon in addition to type 2 or, or interferon gamma. And so there's been some thought uh, that type 1 interferons might play a role. Um, interestingly, type 1 interferons in, are involved in the wound healing response, so you could imagine them playing a role in the Kevner phenomenon. And so we looked into this mechanistically in our mouse model, uh, and we were actually pretty surprised to find that type 1 interferon knockout mice, uh, the, the receptor, IFNAR receptor uh, for type 1 interferons, actually got much, much worse disease than all other mice. Um, and gamma receptor knockouts were protected as we'd expect. So we were really surprised by this. And we did lots more studies over many years to really identify that type one interferons in this model were really just controlling the viral infection. Um, and so the IFNAR knockout mice couldn't control the virus. The virus uh, got to very high levels and that drove very high levels of vitiligo. So we don't think that this is really relevant to, to, to patients with vitiligo. Um, and, and, and so we, we then, uh, created a new model of vitiligo that doesn't require the virus, but can be induced by dendritic cells uh, loaded with antigen. And we found uh, that we did not see this phenomenon anymore because there was no virus growing out of control. And then we found that really type one interferon, at least in the mouse model, didn't really seem to play any role in disease. So it's unclear what's happening in, in humans and whether it contributes, but uh, this is what we know so far. Uh, I'd like to talk about the fact that, that vitiligo seems to uh, relapse very quickly after stopping treatments. We saw this was the case uh, in our ruxolitinib treated patient. He repigmented beautifully, but within just three months of stopping, he lost almost all of his pigment. And we know that this is the case from uh, Thierry Passeron's beautiful paper that he published showing very high rates of relapse, about 40% within a year of stopping treatment. Of course, this can be reduced uh, with uh, topical tacrolimus treatment. Um, but, but maybe even more importantly than the fact that it, it relapses is that it relapses in the exact same locations it was before. So if you have a locate, this was a patient of mine with uh, vitiligo in her abdomen, she repigmented with UV. And then when she stopped it, she relapsed with uh, vitiligo in her abdomen again, first location. And this really suggests that the vitiligo lesions have memory. That skin actually remembers that it had vitiligo there uh, and that it recurs in exact, uh, exactly that location. So what's the cause of this memory? Um, and, and Julian Seneschal is going to talk uh, more in depth about this, but four groups really uh, predicted correctly uh, that autoimmune memory in vitiligo is really due to a subpopulation of T cells called resident memory T cells. Uh, these cells, are their job is to go in and clear a virus uh, infection from the skin and leave some cells behind just in case the virus ever comes back. And it appears that's what's happening in vitiligo as well, uh, that these memory T cells form um, and, and treatments turn them off but are not able to get rid of them and, and then relapse is due to their function. So this is a quick summary of that. CD8 T cells go into the skin and find melanocytes. They make interferon gamma that turns on CXCL10 from keratinocytes and recruits more cells. Uh, and and they, they come in to kill the melanocytes. And so this continued uh, recruitment is, is really the cause of progression of vitiligo. And then at the same time, these T cells can convert uh, to resident memory and insert themselves in the epidermis. Um, when melanocytes try to repigment, they engage, make more interferon gamma, uh, as well as chemokine CXCL10 and recruit more cells that come in and, and kill the cells, uh, the melanocytes. And, and while treatments, including JAK inhibitors, can appear to be able to block the function of these cells um, and, and turn them off, they're not actually able to remove the cells from the skin. And so when the treatments are stopped, these wake back up uh, and reinitiate disease. And we saw that this was the case in our mouse model as well. So when we treated the mice with tofacitinib or ruxolitinib, we got really nice repigmentation. Uh, but the resident memory T cells did not change. Their number did not change in the skin, really indicating that, that the treatments were not able to clear the cells. Uh, and, and this was why we see relapse. Um, but we wanted to re find a way to deplete these cells. You know, if we could remove resident memory T cells from the skin and not just put them to sleep, we would have a much better treatment for vitiligo that might be longer lasting. And, and so long story short, um, many years of work really indicated that they rely on IL-15 signaling for their survival. And so we, we hypothesize that if we target IL-15 signaling, um, we would be able to clear them from the skin. And, and so we saw that IL-15 receptor um, antibody uh, repigmented the mice really very nicely. Uh, 
And not only did the mice repigment, but the resident memory T cells disappeared from the skin. So this really indicated that uh, IL-15 uh, targeting might be a long-term durable treatment for vitiligo. We saw this confirmed in human tissues as well, and so we're optimistic that this will be effective uh, treatment for patients. So this is IL-15 signaling. Keratinocytes make it uh, here, and then it signals T cells through the, the receptor beta chain. Um, and there is an antibody produced by Amgen uh, that exists. It's already been in clinical trials for celiac disease that targets IL-15. And this is actually going to be tested shortly uh, in a clinical trial here in the U.S. Uh, within the next few weeks, likely. Um, in addition, I was able to form a company called Valeris Therapeutics with Series A financing. We're developing an antibody to target the receptor of IL-15 for there are a number of reasons why we think this is going to be a much better and more effective treatment. Uh, and, and the good news is there are lots of uh, opportunities to, to bring this forward in humans. And these will be tested um, clinically. So another question that has come up is, is how T cells kill melanocytes. We know that they, they really remove melanocytes from the skin, but how they do this is still pretty unclear. Um, and, and so uh, there's a, an intriguing hypothesis out there that, that started kind of um, eight to 10 years ago um, that, that um, is, is really lately supported as an immune phenomenon now, um, Dr. Boniface has published this paper recently showing that uh, T cells, which make interferon gamma and TNF alpha, uh, these cytokines actually might um, signal the melanocytes to release from the epidermis and downregulate adhesion molecules, which makes them uh, actually float away through the epidermis and get eliminated um, through the epidermis rather than dropping down into the, into the dermis like, like many of us have thought. So it may be that this is one mechanism of removing melanocytes, that it's actually through the cytokines that the T cells make and, uh, and, and what's called melanocytoragi or um, adhesion release. It's an interesting phenomenon. Another observation that started again eight to ten years ago with uh, Dr. Yuen Zhu observed NK cell increases in lesional skin of vitiligo, uh, and also NKG2D, which is considered a, an NK marker. But but T cells can also make it and be NK-like T cells, and so NKG2D seem to be enriched, and it may be NK cells and T cells that are enriched in the lesions. And the question is whether they're contributing to to melanocyte attack. Um, this was also uh, really supported very recently, again, uh, with Dr. Boniface and, and her colleagues, where they showed that NKG2D expression on CD8 T cells is enriched in active vitiligo, and it strongly correlates with the ability to make interferon gamma, which we've already shown is, is really a key cytokine in driving disease. And, and so this is something to watch, really interesting that NK cells and or CD8 T cells through NKG2D may be playing a role in melanocyte death. Um, T regulatory cells have been hypothesized by many uh, to, to have the capacity to um, prevent vitiligo and suppress disease. This, this paper in 2014 by Shimon Sakaguchi really showed that, um, uh, consistent with other papers, that CD8 T cells that kill melanocytes, melanocyte-specific CD8s, are higher in vitiligo patient blood than in healthy controls. Uh, and if, interestingly, if you look in healthy controls at the melanocyte specific CD8 T cells here in red versus all other CD8 T cells in blue, um, they really are inhibited and in, uh, their ability to make cytokines is mitigated um, in some way. And, and this may be why healthy controls don't get vitiligo, that their CD8 melanocyte, uh, react, melanocyte reactive CD8s are controlled in some way. So they explored this further and co-incubated CD8 T cells with Tregs and found a, a very specific signature. A lot of suppressive molecules, uh, checkpoint inhibitors like PD-1 and LAG-3 and TIM-3 were upregulated by Tregs. And, and they found that the, the melanocyte reactive cells in healthy controls look like this as well. Uh, they upregulated a very similar profile, really suggesting that Tregs were preventing the activity of these cells in healthy controls, preventing vitiligo. If you look at melanocyte reactive T cells in vitiligo patients here in red, they had a very different profile where they looked much more active. Uh, they had lower uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and, and this is likely a, re a reason why vitiligo patients get vitiligo. So many speculated, you know, that there was a, a problem with Tregs in vitiligo, and this is why patients get it. Uh, but there have been a lot of publications, some saying that there are fewer Tregs in, in patients in the blood. Some say that there are normal numbers, but they just don't home to the skin very well. Others suggest that they're, they're all normal number, but they, they just don't work as well. 
And so it's still pretty unclear uh, as, to, as to what the, the defect is in, in, in vitiligo patients. However, we do know that uh, in mouse models, Tregs do play a, a key role. So if you deplete Tregs in mouse models, vitiligo gets much worse. You can see that here and here. This is in one model. Um, in, in a separate model, if you deplete Tregs, again, it gets worse. This is Caroline Lapools. And, and if you enhance Tregs by recruiting them through a chemokine called CCL22, it improves disease. We also have some unpublished data uh, using diphtheria toxin. When we deplete Tregs, disease gets much worse in the mice. When we add them back, when they're not there in the first place, they suppress disease. And so this really indicates that Tregs do play an important role, but we need to know a lot more about how they do this. So we'll add those to the, uh, to the illustration. Tregs suppress CD8s. They get into the skin through CCL22. And then finally, just at the very end, I, just talking about initiation of disease. Um, and, and there are a number of thoughts that melanocytes contribute to disease initiation. And, and this may be through secretion of factors that initiate inflammation and autoimmunity. And you'll see some posters on that as well. Uh, Caroline Lapool has really championed this effort. You can, you, you'll, you'll recognize HSP70. Uh, being secreted by T cells, uh, by, by melanocytes as enhancing disease. So when you inject HSP70 into a mouse model, it makes the disease worse. Uh, you can see that again here. If the mice don't have HSP70, disease is, is improved and they have a harder time developing disease. And then she's also shown that if you just mutate uh, HSP70 with one amino acid, um, that can actually uh, re, uh, change the inflammation such that dendritic cells appear to be more tolerogenic instead of inflammatory. And this may be a treatment uh, for vitiligo. She showed that was the case in Sinclair swine uh, model where melanoma-induced vitiligo was reversed by uh, injecting this modified HSP70 and, and suggesting that this might be a treatment for vitiligo as well. So this is a quick summary suggesting that melanocytes cell stress either through uh, chemical triggers or other intrinsic defects, maybe genetic effects, results in melanocyte release of, uh, of inflammatory molecules that activate the innate immune system that then induces autoimmunity. So this is a quick summary of all that I spoke about today, adding some more pieces, certainly really representing a, a heroic work from people all over the world to contribute to this. Uh, JAK inhibitors appear to be um, great opportunities to intervene here in the immunology to treat vitiligo. We think IL-15 is, is probably going to be a better treatment. Um, but overall, we're learning a lot, and there, there's still a lot to learn. So this is just the group that does the work in our lab. I always like to thank them and my collaborators, including Amit Pandya, um, to help us uh, learn a lot about vitiligo. And, and I'm happy to take questions at their time. So my Actually, uh, uh, Harris, congratulations. That's a really wonderful, uh, very insightful uh, uh, lecture. It was uh, comprehensive, yet uh, uh, very, very precise. And it's heartening to know that uh, those of us who are working on, on the concept of this pathogenesis and also the stability of vitiligo for the last 20, 25 years, and uh, it's still when uh, I remember when Paul Grimes in 1986 first reported the reduction of the number of uh, uh, lymphocyte and uh, in, uh, like uh, helper T cells, an increase in the number of NK cells. And uh, from there it started. And then the, the various uh, uh, works on the, um, uh, the T cell T8 and T uh, helper suppressor ratio. And, uh, so, and, and today what you presented is, is really uh, mind blowing and the congratulations to you uh, once again. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, so make sure. Hi, John. Can I can I add a can I add a comment? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, in 2011, 2012, when we were studying patients uh, who were undergoing transplantation, non-segmental vitiligo, and we were doing immunohistochemistry uh, at the baseline, taking a skin biopsy, then following them up to see uh, the response we found that CD45 RO positive cells, they were absent in all patients who relapsed or who did not um, uh, repigment well. It, they were not present in all who succeeded, uh, who, in, in whom the transplantation succeeded, but none of the patients who 
succeeded showed uh, CD45 RO positive cells. And it, they were seen only in those who did not repigment with transplantation. Not all of them, but many of them. So uh, it seems that they play a significant role. And now uh, this lecture is very timely because in India, there are many companies recently launched JEC inhibitors yes. at a very affordable price. So it's uh, only a few days ago, these companies, they launched uh, JEC inhibitors. Uh, Tofacitinib, do you think any one of these JEC inhibitors is better than others in vitiligo? Well, they've never been compared head to head. And I think that would be really helpful if they were. Uh, we do think, I, I personally think that ruxolitinib is, is more effective than tofacitinib. Uh, it's a JAK1-2 inhibitor instead of a JAK1-3. Um, that's just anecdotal. It's just kind of from using both of them and, and seeing just the amazing response from Rux. That's also the case incidentally in alopecia areata. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I think ruxolitinib is a little more potent at inhibiting specifically interferon gamma, which may be why it's more effective, but we won't know for sure until they're compared head to head. Can we ask the chairs to notice the chat box, please? There's multiple questions there. Yeah, I, I started seeing them. I, I could I could just address them. Uh, one person asked, uh, interestingly, IL-15 signals through JAK1 and 3. Um, so why would IL-15 inhibition be different than JAK inhibition? Um, so if tofacitinib blocks JAK1 and 3 and IL-15 signals through JAK1 and 3, you'd think TOFA would be the same as IL-15 inhibition. And I've thought a lot about this, actually. Uh, this was one of my questions early on as well. And um, it, it, there are two possible answers. It's possible that tofacitinib does not block JAK1-3 enough to block the complete signal of IL-15. Uh, and, and that um, that JAK inhibitor is just, we'd need a much more potent JAK inhibitor to completely block that signal. Um, and that that that's likely because the more receptors you block, the more uh, toxic the drug will likely be. And so you have to kind of uh, get a drug that, that's moderately effective so it doesn't cause too many side effects. So it could be that IL-15, you know, blocks much more potently the antibody. The second possibility is that IL-15 does signal through JAKS 1 and 3, but it signals through some other pathways as well. Um, and we don't know which pathway is critical for resident memory T cells. So it could very well be that just because even though IL-15 signals through JAKS 1 and 3, it may be through PI3 kinase, for example, um, that, that the resident memory T cells signal. And that might, that might be the more important pathway. Um, we don't know, but we're looking into this for sure. Um, Barbara asked, does UVB have any role in decreasing killing uh, resident memory T cells? We don't think so. Um, and, and, and that makes evolutionary sense as well, because the, their job, resident memory T cells job is to protect us from viruses. Uh, and you don't want to go out in the sun and, and lose all your immunity. Um, and, and so I think historically UVB will turn off their function. Um, and that's why UVB works in vitiligo. But as soon as you stop it, they wake back up. Uh, and Thierry throw, showed that beautifully, that UVB is, is not a long-term treatment. Uh, it's still... Um, disease relapses after that. Um, stop me when when we're out of time. Uh, so memory T cell depletion, any known environmental triggers? No. Uh, and and I, I think that you wouldn't want that as we just talked about UVB does not deplete them and you wouldn't want that too. So so they're really sticky cells. They're, they're there for good. Um, probably because again of the viral uh, antiviral response. And gut mi microbiome, Lapool published, um, there's, there's clear data that the, the microbiome shapes the immune system um, and, and, and the immune system, the, the microbiome on the skin and in the gut and, and other places really kind of educates the immune system and shapes it early on. Um, and, and there's a lot of connection between microbiome and lots of autoimmunity. And so I think there's a lot to learn. I think there's a lot we don't know, um, but I think it's important to, to look at. Um, for sure. Th there's some data actually that the microbiome influences response to checkpoint inhibitors in melanoma. Um, and, and so because of that, uh, that was a really high impact paper. And, and, and so because of that, it really reinforces the idea that the gut micro, microbiome plays an important role. Um, Question on aprimilist. So any role of aprimilist in vitiligo treatment? What do you oh, see? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I think uh, Thierry published a paper early on that it, it, it did not help. He did a clinical trial um, that, that tested it with and without narrowband UVB. I thought the trial was a really good one. Um, I thought the data were really clear um, that, it, that it doesn't play a role. There's some other studies being done and, and we'll have to see. Um, I don't mechanistically, I don't know how it would work, you know, in, in terms of the known inflammatory pathways. They're very different from psoriasis. 
Um, but I think uh, Thierry's past, uh, paper was really a good one to, to tell us probably not. And I think we're out of time. I'm, I'm going to hit this chat hard and reply to everybody personally. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, John.